here we are. We got Eric and Zeno here. Nice to meet y'all. Um, cool. Well, today this will be fun. Uh, we'll see how long this lasts. This may be, uh, this may be 10 minutes. This may be a full 60. Uh, we appreciate everyone who dialed in. We are recording this. Uh, we'll share it with folks afterwards. Um, but what we're going to be talking about today is uh, what it means to be enterprise ready at an early stage. And before we get started here, let's start off with some intros. Um, I'll kick it off first. My name is Eric Martin. I lead sales here at Vanta. Been here for about two and a half years. Um, Vanta being my third uh, kind of SaaS uh, software business that I've, I've been at. Uh, background in engineering, a couple uh, attempts at starting my own companies. And uh, here we are uh, in the world of sales. Um, but yeah, um, we get a front row seat to kind of meeting and assisting startup founders and just kind of startups in general who are looking to sell to the enterprise. Uh, in our day-to-day -day here at Vanta. So really excited to shed some light on what we see and what you might want to get out in front of. You know, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Yeah, I'm the VP of Developer Experience at WorkOS. Uh, before that, I was the Chief Product Officer at Lifeway Cloud. And that's where I first got exposed to this enterprise readiness world. So uh, we built like a deployment platform that was tailored to SMBs, didn't work out. We pivot to the enterprise market and then we had a huge boom, $7 million in ARR in two years. So that was a really interesting moment where we had to build a lot of enterprise features and we had all those challenges with InfoSec policies. So yeah, uh, it was a hard moment, uh, but we learned a lot. So really excited to be sharing those lessons learned here. Awesome. And for folks who like are unfamiliar with uh, a, what it means to be a VP of developer experience, you mind shedding like 30 seconds of light on like, what does that mean? Like, what are your roles and responsibilities? Yeah, that's pretty interesting, right? It's not a very common uh, job title, but what this basically means is sweating all the details around how developers uh, interact with WorkOS. So this is like looking at the documentation, making sure we have everything on point there and all the integrations and everything that we do, everything's really connected and really speaks to how developers want to use a product. So that's my goal here, like making sure that everybody's happy while they're using WorkOS. Cool, I love it, sweet. Well, this will be fun for folks because we have kind of uh, myself on the, very much on the sales side and uh, Zeno very much on like a different side of the house. And so hopefully we, you'll get, if nothing else, uh, kind of two sides of, uh, I guess, of the, uh, the coin here. All right, as far as agenda, uh, we're gonna go over a couple of things. We're gonna go over, what is it, what does enterprise ready mean? Uh, when and how does what does you know do you get enterprise ready? Uh, we'll talk a little bit about Vanta and WorkOS, and then we'll save some time for questions. Um, I think for starters, I'm going to kick this one over to Zena. You want to kind of talk through to this, and we can make this a conversation. But I'll let you kick it off. Yeah, I feel like one of the interesting pieces when you start thinking about how, how do you become enterprise ready is when do we actually do it, right? What is the company size, timeline wise, and Sharing some of my personal experience when I was at Life for Cloud, we were building this product and we realized while like a, about like 20 people in the team that we needed those enterprise features. We had this product called We Deploy. It was working really well. People were loving it, but our business model wasn't right. Like the, the persona that we're targeting wasn't right. Once we moved to, now we had to worry about all these other things. And this was a, a really interesting moment in time where we really had to think about that. And we built everything ourselves. We didn't know that Venta existed in the first place. So we had like this entire effort on InfoSec policies, writing those from scratch. And we had nobody that was really qualified to do that. So it took weeks to train that person and then months to develop those policies. And that's the same for the engineering side of things, like building all those features. So I'm curious, like if you had other experiences too, like this, Eric, where you're talking to teams and they're trying to figure out like, when should we actually do it? Like, what, what, what does that mean? Like, how can I prepare for this journey? Yep. Yep. Totally. So at Vanta, right? Like we help over 2000 startups with kind of, kind of continuously monitoring security and compliance. And many of these companies come to us um, because they have some big fish on the hook who uh, is kind of demanding that they kind of prepare, like are able to show them a SOC 2 report, an ISO 27001 CERT, et cetera. And uh, many of these companies that we work with are extremely early stage. And when we talk about like size and the size consideration, these folks out of the gates 
had kind of determined that like they were going to sell to the enterprise. And so it's interesting, right? Like um, you have, when you think about size, there's kind of like two cups of tea, I think, right? Like there are those who come out of the gates who say, Hey, like the nature of our business is such that like, this is going, what we're building, like needs to have immediate appeal to these big businesses. So mm -hmm. like, we're going to do our best leaning on kind of our previous experiences, our advisors, kind of, uh, you know, what we find on the internet to kind of get us kind of as prepared as possible. Then you have the other instance where, and actually we're kind of experiencing this ourselves recently, which is that we've predominantly been selling to the SMB and now we're starting to get interest from like quite large public businesses. And so now we're having to actually go through some of the swing motions of figuring out like, cool, like, you know, are we ready to sell the enterprise? Do we want to sell to the enterprise, et cetera? I think it, you know, would be remiss if we didn't kind of gloss at least over kind of the procedural and kind of the, um, I guess like more human centered decisions that, that need to like go on or like take place within an org when you get the opportunity to sell to these big businesses, right? Like one of the things I'll say is that like when we talk to small companies um, and they say that they have this big fish on the hook, one of the first questions we ask is like, you know, is this, is this the, you know, does this company that is asking for this in, within your ICP, right? Like, is this the type of company you want to sell to and, or is this an anomaly? And is the entire company on board with kind of doing what needs to be done to support them? Um, I think what I'd be curious to hear from, you, from your standpoint um, is, you know, is like maybe shedding a, a little bit more light on some of the product considerations that a company might need to kind of make or think about when they want to sell up market. Yeah, I think you touched on a really interesting point, which is having that buy-in uh, for your startup, right? Because when you embark on this journey, it's going to be a very interesting journey where you need executive alignment. You're going to need product management alignment. Too. They're going to need to rethink their roadmap and the features that they're going to prioritize. Engineering buy-in as well, right? Like if the engineers are not excited to build those things, it's going to, you're going to have a really hard time to actually go after that. And sales, right? Like uh, one thing that was common for us back then was we had a sales selling those enterprise features that we didn't have yet. So we there's all <laughs> like this tension around yeah. like how can we actually provide those information, right? So in terms of features, you know, as a product team, there's so many things you need to consider, right? Like you need to consider how users are going to authenticate into your product, how they are going to manage their permissions and roles uh, inside that application, the reporting, the analytics piece of it, what happens if an employee is using a service and then that employee is no longer working for that company, how you manage that entire workflow. So there's some really interesting pieces that we can uh, dive in uh, that are crucial to making a product enterprise ready. Yeah. So like, even though I, I say engineering background, full disclosure, mm -hmm. mechanical engineering background, so uh, <laughs> very different from my, my uh, computer yeah. engineering friends. Uh, that said, like I, I, I always, when I think about becoming enterprise ready and like kind of friction or hurdles from a product standpoint, I think about the last company I was at, um, I remember the first time that we got requested to kind of enable single sign-on, uh -huh. uh, you know, in order to support them. The company was financial force that like we were trying to close the deal with. And I, our engineering team, like we had to have like pretty serious conversations with like between kind of myself, my head of sales and our head of product on like, can we do this? And mm -hmm. we ended up, I, I don't know how we, I think we ended up like kind of talking our way around or probably promising that we would do it by a certain time period. But I remember it was like, it created real friction. And so like, you know, the, sex, the second point here is on like timelines, right? So maybe like what, what might be helpful for folks kind of tuning in here are, is like, give us a sense for kind of the kind of time investment it might otherwise take to become enterprise ready. Maybe just picking on that example, if someone was to do it kind of traditionally versus, and not to just kind of immediately kind of to uh, work OS's horn here, but like if they were to use work OS, like what's the Delta and like the time investment? Because you know, these engineering kind of hours are, are precious and it's a precious cost. Yeah, totally. And as a business, what you're trying to do is maximizing that engineering time to be creating the product that you want to create, right? Like creating actual value. And it's really tricky to balance those two. Uh, we have seen uh, like personally uh, from like previous experiences, I've seen teams taking months to build those uh, functionalities. And it usually starts with SSO. I think you nailed it. Like this is a crucial piece because it's all around how do you have access to a certain system? 
And SSO is this way of providing this uniform access. And for us, we had to deal with many different providers and we had to build all that ourselves. The whole team, like the engineers, they were not excited about learning SAML and other obscure standards. And we didn't know WorkOS existed uh, back then as well. So we, we built everything and it took months. Uh, Let, let's, now, let's, if you don't mind, like taking yeah. one step, taking one step back just for folks who may not know, like why did, why does the enterprise care about enabling something like SSO? Yeah, this is really interesting. Like imagine you work for Notion, right? Like, so you have a startup that is extremely popular, have thousands of users. And among those users, you have people that are working at really big companies, like let's say the New York Times. So there's, those New York Times users, they're now hosting company data inside Notion. And now if you were, if you were an IT manager at New York Times, you're really worried about what are those users are gonna put over there? Like what happens if one leaves or uh, how do we control access if we want to expand the usage of Notion inside the New York Times, for example. So what is really important for those IT managers is having control. That's the key word for everything. Like they want to be able to control not only Notion, but all these other uh, services that they buy, like HubSpot for marketing, uh, status page for the DevOps team, uh, Salesforce for the sales team. So you have all these different services and what the IT department wants is to be able to have their employees to log in for one identity provider and they don't really need to care about having multiple accounts into every single service. So it's a security uh, concern that they have and it's an extremely valid one because you're hosting company data and that's why SSO is definitely the number one uh, requirement for an enterprise journey. Yeah. What's number two from a product standpoint? Number two, I would say the directory uh, integration. So once you have users authenticating into this, that's one thing, right? Like, okay, this is one piece of this the puzzle. It's it's extremely important, but it solves just one use case. Another use case is if you have users that are coming in, uh, employees that are coming into this system and you have like a new employee, right? So a new employee for marketing, let's say, if you're not using uh, directory sync, what you, what you need to do is you have to request access, open a ticket on Jira, and then that person, that person manually goes to HubSpot, adds access to that uh, employee. And that's a lot of work, right? It's not automated at all. So what companies do, they have these systems where you can put all your employees and you include those employees in different groups like departments and the roles and permissions inside that. And then when a new employee joins in this, in the same case, like now this employee like is added to the marketing group and then they get automatic access to HubSpot, for example. Uh, so this works for new employees and also for employees that are being fired or leaving yeah. the company. So let's say you have an employee that has access to Salesforce that employee leaves. And if you don't control the session, like that employee can still have access to all the systems. Even if you remove their login, they might be already authenticated. So yeah. you need a way to control that management session. And that's why directory sync is a crucial one. Yeah, it's super interesting. And that's, that's cool to hear because like, you know, for, you know, we'll touch on this in a second, but like another big kind of component of kind of being enterprise ready is kind of having your ducks in a row from a security and compliance standpoint. And in many cases, for better or worse, these like bigger businesses are going to ask you as a startup or just a business moving up market to provide something like a SOC 2 report. And what you just described uh, is like very much kind of entrenched within SOC 2, right? There are any number of kind of, let's call them access controls, right? So within Vanta, what we do is same thing, like we keep kind of an active directory of kind of new employees and terminated employees and we allow you to kind of like make sure that you're kind of granting and revoking access to any of your kind of like business critical or in scope vendors in adherence with your set SLAs, making sure that like, you know, once again, like you are being thoughtful and you're kind of following through on these kind of best practices. So um, that's cool. I didn't realize that was like a, a number two. I appreciate yeah. that. The biggest challenge with that is once you start integrating, let's say, well, with an active directory like Azure AD, right? Like that's one provider. There's so many different other providers and that's the same for SSO too. So this is a big challenge that WorkOS solves where 
you don't have to worry about every single provider. You have just one API, one connection, and then you enable and unlock all those enterprise deals with only one thing. So, Cool. I love it. I love it. Well, we've talked a little bit about like stakeholders and decision makers. I think like um, I'll just kind of repeat for, for folks here that like, you know, in many instances, you know, if you're an early stage company that out of the gates is going to sell to the enterprise, <laughs> it's like, it's probably you and your co-founder or like, you know, you, your co-founder and like the first couple employees who are kind of the stakeholders and get to decide this, you've probably also already pitched that this is kind of the direction that you're going to go out of the gates to anyone who gave you funding. So um, I think like this is interesting on like the kind of early, early stage scale, but I'm curious, like as some, as like a, an existing company wants to move up market or sell the enterprise from your perspectives, you know, like, you know, who then become kind of additional stakeholders or decision makers? Yeah, we typically see product managers being really involved, like with companies that are getting bigger, let's say Airtable or Slack, they have a dedicated enterprise team of engineers and product managers that are working um, towards this. There's also the, the, the whole security department. So those people are very involved and informed with every single decision. But I would say the executive team is always the, the most important one is the one that you need to make sure that they understand the value and that they are really in touch with that strategy moving forward. Cool. I love it. I love it. Well, let's see what's next here. Uh, we've talked about this a little bit. We've talked about kind of what does it mean, you know, right? There's, there's kind of today we're focusing on just kind of two pieces. There's the control and the trust. Uh, I think like Zeno's done a good job of articulating from, from a control standpoint, kind of what that means and kind of like why the enterprise cares about that. From a trust standpoint, we've talked about this a little bit, right? It's like, um, you know, more often than not, you know, when you move up market, you know, these businesses want to make sure that kind of, um, you know, you're not going to be a backdoor for hackers kind of getting into kind of any of their sensitive data. And so it's not uncommon for these folks to ask you to present something like a SOC 2 report, you know, ISO 27001 cert, et cetera. Um, and so in this kind of context for this webinar, like when we say trust, like we're talking about kind of like getting that third party trust as in like you've gone through a third party attestation, you have the report to show and you hopefully have a monitoring, a security monitoring tool like Avanta that makes sure that like not only are your controls in place on day one, but we're monitoring these things on the hour and alerting folks internally when those ducks may go out of row so that you can go in and kind of make sure that you're not going to be the one who they point their fingers at. Yeah. Um, and so once again, we've talked about this a little bit. Can we talk about SCIM, Zina? Yeah, sure. Uh, just to uh, touch on, on what you just said, I feel like the keyword for enterprises are peace of mind, right? Like that's what they ultimately want. So they would pay more. They would like close a bigger deal with you if you have those things. And that's what they care. They, they want to have control over everything that you do. And they want to trust you that you do what you say you do, right? So that's why they're so important. For control, we, we talked about SAML being this standard for SSO. And it's there are other standards uh, around uh, SSO as well. We have OAuth, OpenID Connect, uh, and they are a little bit hard to implement. Uh, and that's the same for uh, SCAM, which is a re relatively new uh, standard. It's being adopted, but that's the one that when we talk about active directories, that's the one that people are uh, using and adopting right now. Now, what is tricky about those standards is that they are a little bit outdated and it's not very clear how to implement them. And engineers typically don't get too excited about building those things. They want to focus at their core business, right? Like if you, if you go work at Airtable or Notion, you go there because you love collaboration, you love notes you, you love productivity apps and that's why like when you get into the trenches of building those things it gets really complicated and and that's what work west tries to solve and and standardize nice nice i think it's the same for us if i learned anything as kind of leading sales here and working very closely with our head of product and engineering it's like it's all a give and take you know it's like if you want this you're not gonna get that you know and it's like and so um yeah, I appreciate the the kind of time savings, I suppose, here that, that both solutions are, are attempting to offer here. Um, once again, I'm going to breeze through a couple more of these slides here. 
Um, and I'm going to actually just ask you, Zeno here, if you want to like, just kind of speak to work OS a little more specifically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, as I was saying, right, like implementing those things by yourself definitely takes a lot of work and a lot of energy that you have to invest. And it's okay if you want to do it. Right. But as you scale your business, as you are like looking to build this platform that is going to solve the exact business case that you're willing to solve, it's a really compelling uh, story to use a, a provider like WorkOS to manage that for you. So we have single sign-on, which is definitely our uh, most important product and is the most used one right now where we have this unified API that you can use to authenticate to like 13 identity providers and, and many others. Uh, we have directory sync. So that's what, when we talk about provisioning and deprovisioning users, that's what you, you can use. And it also integrates with a ton of HRIS tools like Workday, Gusto, all that kind of thing. And then we have admin portal. And that's one, that one is really interesting. Um, again, speaking uh, like in terms of like experiencing in other companies, I remember when we had the SSO offer, we had so much back and forth between support and the customer to figure out like how you set up SSO because you need to make changes to your system and also to the customer's uh, identity provider. So it's a lot of work and a lot of back and forth. And what this does is this normalized interface that has every little step that you can do with all the configurations that you need for every provider. So you can just give that to those IT managers and then they can run with it and you don't have to do that back and forth. So that's what we do. And we really, stress about the developer experience and we want to build a product that developers love and yeah we're starting with those three but we are, we're definitely um exploring other areas like audit logs and, and things like that which we're going to be working in the future nice at what stage should a company be in before they like where or when they kind of look at work os yeah i would say there are many different ways to approach this right like one just like you said like you have this one big customer that are that is coming in and they want to sponsor your trajectory with uh, enterprise readiness. For us, like back then, we like we had Vodafone. Like we we were like closing deals with McDonald's, with uh, Pizza Hut, and then Vodafone was this customer that they were trying to move to the cloud seven times, they failed, and then they <laughs> loved our product. And then they said, "Oh no, this is amazing. We're gonna help you guys become enterprise ready, and we're gonna like." we're willing to navigate with you uh, for this for this space. So this is really nice. If you have that, I think it's amazing. And that's the obvious approach, right? You wait until you have that enterprise need and then you work on that. Another approach is if you get prepared beforehand. So this can sometimes be a chicken and egg problem where if you don't have the enterprise features, customers are not even going to get to your pipeline. They're not going to download your white paper and you're not going to have those prospects in hand and but if you do have them then they start coming up so this is something that you can always approach that way where even if you don't have the pipeline you can already start like piling up those enterprise features and then when they come in you're ready to serve them i love it i love it and you and thank you for sharing that in your role i'm just curious like uh, have you invested in kind of things like actually building communities for these developers? Like, how do you kind of solicit feedback uh, from these, your kind of your champions such that like you have the confidence that you need that like your continuous, your like work OS is continuing to build like the, the best product possible for them? Yeah, we're like pretty active uh, on Twitter, for example, whenever someone says something like we want to make sure that we are addressing their needs. Like we had a, a, a person who was was like, asking how can I set up like SSO and then in one day they started like trying out the product they integrated and then they deployed to production in less than 24 hours so we're like really in touch with people in every channel they are so if it's social media we're going to be there on the product too we have like uh, spaces for feedback and we act on every single feedback we follow up so the person feels that okay when I'm giving feedback these people are listening and they are uh, solving those problems. So that creates this trust uh, flywheel with customers. And uh, yeah, we all, we're all also on Slack answering every single question and nice. making sure that people are happy there. What about you oh, guys? Like, uh, I love how it. do you manage the, the feedback cycle? 
Yeah, it's a great question. So for us, like we, um, we have any number of kind of feedback loops that we have in place, whether it's kind of dedicated Slack channels with kind of, you know, CPA partners and or customers, or just kind of, you know, our CSMs are kind of checking in, kind of making sure that folks are kind of getting through this kind of process, getting into an audit ready state or kind of advancing and kind of adding additional Boy Scout patches to their kind of security mm -hmm. dashboards um, on a weekly basis, right? And so between the customer success team, our in-house kind of risk and assurance team with in-house CPAs, who are also pro providing that kind of like assurance, all of these stakeholders, including the reps on my team are kind of continuously soliciting feedback, whether it's from prospects or customers. And uh, we actually, uh, we use Airtable, they're an Avanta customer uh, mm -hmm. to kind of channel that feedback and make sure that it's, it's shared to the appropriate stakeholders internally. But yeah, it's a good question. That's awesome. Uh, from a Vanta standpoint, once again, we'll keep it short and sweet. Once again, right, we've talked about kind of the control and the trust side. Uh, you know, uh, one of the things that inevitably you're going to get asked for if you're selling up market is to provide kind of some kind of third party attestation. Um, if you're in the United States, it's probably going to be a SOC 2. If you're um, abroad uh, selling to businesses abroad, it may be ISO 27001. Uh, we also help companies with, with HIPAA. And later this, um, in the next, I guess in the next couple of weeks, I should say, we're rolling out products that are support PCI as well as GDPR. Um, but our bread and butter today, as I mentioned, we have over 2000 businesses that lean on us to help kind of, you know, streamline as much as possible the kind of, like, you know, initial readiness and the ongoing kind of monitoring uh, of their controls to get into kind of a SOC 2, an ISO or HIPAA ready state. Um, the way that we do this is fairly straightforward, right? We connect with read-only APIs to different kind of business critical vendors. Um, this is kind of what makes Vanta, kind of, or I guess I should say back in 2017, made Vanta unique as kind of the creator of this kind of cloud compliance category. Um, those tests that we run against those API connections map back to kind of satisfying different controls. Uh, inevitably, there are technical controls and non-technical. For the non-technical controls, we give people the opportunity to upload kind of evidence, we send them reminders if they need to give us that evidence on some kind of recurring basis. Um, and then you mentioned earlier, kind of a, a big pain for you was tied to generating InfoSec policies. Uh, we partnered with a company called BSI. Uh, it's a British company that literally authored ISO 27001 to kind of create policy templates for our customers to help them satisfy kind of, you know, the documentation side of, of all that's required. So in any case, once again, as I mentioned, we work with startups today, but we also work with public companies. And so it, it runs the gamut. And um, I'd like to think that we're, uh, we're, we're pretty enterprise ready. Let's put it that way. Um, but I think that's kind of all we have here. So uh, we have some time for, for questions. Um, it doesn't look like we have any yet. We've just seemingly done such a good job kind of getting out in front of those. Uh, but you know, any final words from you? I would any say advice, like, any advice to folks? Yeah, I would say like if you are like looking into embarking on this uh, on this enterprise journey, I would say go for it. You know, speaking from personal experience, this was what determined our success. Uh, if we didn't go enterprise ready back then, we would wouldn't have like uh, the team that we had, the growth that we had, and maybe we would have to like eventually like shut down our product because we didn't have. Uh, that cycle and once you understand the value of being enterprise ready man it unlocks so many interesting opportunities and I feel like this may sound a little bit hard at first you have like all the words and those jargons that you probably don't understand first but once you really dive into this you understand that okay I do this one step I get my certification with Vanta I start like implementing my enterprise features and now you get to a point where you can unlock those really big deals. And uh, that's definitely something uh, really interesting. And I highly recommend people to go after that. Awesome, dude. I appreciate sharing that. <laughs> we do have one question that just came in, which is like, how does the scope of time and effort change as one goes from SOC 2 to ISO 27001? I'm going to answer this assuming that someone like already has a SOC 2 report and they're wanting to kind of add kind of uh, that ISO kind of cert. Um, and so effectively, like the way that we think about it, right? Like there's quite a bit of overlap between SOC 2 and ISO. Um, broad strokes, we think of ISO as a more kind of like document heavy certificate. Um, and so when you're kind of preparing for SOC 2, you'll have kind of a policy stack, right? Of like kind of long form kind of procedural things that like you as a company agree to doing. 
you'll also have kind of like the corresponding technical controls. And I, so it's like, yeah, I'm gonna keep this very simple and say it like, it's, ooh, sorry, dog's barking. Uh, it's not, not too dissimilar, pardon me. Uh, not too dissimilar in that you'll have your kind of policy stack, but for ISO, uh, you'll also be required to create what's called an ISMS. And this ISMS in simple form is just an additional kind of like a you know, set of policies. Um, and so in the Vanta world, the additional work on the policy side is we just make available to you these additional policies, these templates that you get to go through and kind of fill out as, as kind of it fits your business. On the technical side, and I'm keeping this really simple, there's a huge overlap in the technical controls in ISO land. Those are called like your annex A controls. And so the lift is, um, you know, I'm not, I, I'm going to say it depends on the, it, it, if I've learned anything in the world of compliance to answer a question intelligently, I should respond with it depends. Uh, and so in terms of like the actual extra calories from a time standpoint, uh, it depends, right? It depends on kind of like, do you have a stock to, do you not, was it a type one? Was it a type two? Um, you know, and and frankly, like in another element, another kind of dimension here is how big is your business? I would say this much um, if you want to go into a little more detail there, including kind of what the additional cost might be, by all means, feel free to email, email me at eric at vanta.com. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so in any case, um, I think just once again, we appreciate everyone joining here. I'll, I'll say as one final thing, which is that like, you know, um, uh, if you're a startup out of the gates that like your business model is kind of requires or like is kind of baked on selling the enterprise, like go nuts. If you're in a spot where like you haven't historically sold the enterprise and you get the opportunity to, this is where I would encourage you to kind of like think critically about kind of, you know, whether or not that's a direction that you, you actually want to go, you know, and this is an opportunity where when you're presented the opportunity to like go sell a deal to someone like a Microsoft, it's like, you know, have the discussions internally, but have the discussions externally, right? Like the startup world is small. Inevitably you have friends who have kind of like, you know, sold to the enterprise. And so I would encourage you to reach out to them, ask them kind of like, you know, how they decided to do that. You know, what kind of, you know, decisions did they have to make or sacrifice did they have to make from like a kind of business growth and or a kind of just a, a product roadmap standpoint. I would also encourage you to reach out in that situation to your advisors and your investors. You know, it's one of those things where like, that's kind of why these people exist. They are, they're all invested in your success. And, you know, just because you get the opportunity to go sell up market to the enterprise doesn't mean that you should do it. Right. I just want to make sure that people like know that. Right. Um, and so, you know, I would just say, keep that in mind. And then if you do end up making a decision where this is something that you want to invest in and you want to kind of like do this with the, like kind of the least friction, least amount of friction possible. And by friction, I mean, kind of like kind of optimizing for time cost savings. This is where I would encourage you to reach out, you know, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, Eric at Vanta.com. If you go to Vanta.com, you can fill out a, a demo form. Same thing with WorkOS. Um, we try to be as consultative as possible here. My full-time job when I used to sell Vanta was to like, you know, help people avoid or delay getting a SOC to report. And I think I like to believe that's still largely true with our team today. Um, ultimately thinking about kind of, you know, what's important to you in your business and helping you kind of maximize the time you get to spend kind of building the next best thing. So with that, I think we will say our goodbyes and say, thanks for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, you know, hey, wait, real quick, one last plug. Zeno, what's the name of your podcast? Uh, it's By Talk. Yeah, <laughs> you could check it out, By Talk. Awesome, yeah. cool, great. Well, Zeno, it's been a pleasure, man. We'll talk to you guys yeah. soon. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.